Our scripture reading today comes from Genesis chapter 25. It will begin in verse 11 and go to the end of the chapter. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac lived by Ber Lahayaro. Now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abram, Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in order of their birth. Nebioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Abdil, and Mibsam, and Mibsha, and Duma, and Masa, Hada, and Tima, Jetur, Nipsha, and Kedma. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps, twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is in the east of Egypt, as one goes towards Assyria. He settled in defiance of all his relatives. Now these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abram became the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paran Aram, the sister of Laban the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterwards his brother came forth, with his hand holding on to Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man, living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please, let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, Behold, I am about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, First, swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave, gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Before our guest speaker comes today, by way of introduction, I don't know that I've ever really told very many of you how I came to be involved in a Messianic congregation. Uh, as many of you may know, I, to the best of my knowledge, have absolutely no uh, Jewish ancestry at all. But in college, I stumbled across some Messianic literature, and I found it fascinating to read because obviously the Old Testament especially, some of the stories that I grew up hearing, were taken so seriously and were uh, given significant thought and consideration. It really, it, it was something that excited me. It engaged me in thinking more about the scriptures myself. In 97, my wife and I were living in Rochester, New York, and I happened to be profoundly, pathetically lost one day, and I drove past Shema Yisrael, a messianic congregation, and I thought, wow, this is fascinating. Here it is. Now, if only I could find my way home, I might have a clue as to how to get back. <laughs> well, it took forever to get back home, but I looked it up, and we started attending there very briefly. Again, shortly later in 97 is when we moved to the Chicago area. Looking around for churches in downtown Chicago for us was tough. <clears throat> uh, Moody is there. It's huge. It's enormous. I felt like, you know, a little pebble on the beach or something like that. Um, other churches in the area, frankly, are so liberal, they're worthless. They do not at all adhere to or hold or value what Scripture says. But one day at Moody Church, 
I stumbled across one of the associate pastors there named Roy Schwartz. He gave me his business card, and I held on to it, and, and he mentioned as he gave that card to me that he was the head of a Messianic congregation in the area. Huh, this is fascinating, and I just stuffed the card in my pocket. Almost a year went by of going to different churches in the downtown area and looking around and getting frustrated. And there was one that was walking distance from our apartment, which I really loved being that close. But every week was just a dirge. Reading scripture at this church, it was so holy and sanctimonious that we were all about to die from boredom. Oh. I pulled out Roy Schwartz's card. I went to a dot hatikva the very next week on Saturday, and I heard Roy Schwartz preach, and it was exciting. This man knew the Old Testament. He had obviously put significant thought into it, but it was real. It was vital. The relationship that he was demonstrating as he preached, his enthusiasm for God's word was captivating. It was contagious. I never left the congregation. Well, I, obviously I'm here now. Okay, I have to, I have to qualify that. We didn't go anywhere else. We didn't even consider it for years. I just want you to hear a little bit of that. That is how I got to know Roy Schwartz, our guest speaker today. Please, come. Wow. Thanks, John. I don't even remember meeting him. Like I tell my wife all the time, I got a great memory, it's just short. <laughs> well, let me pray. Father, I do thank you and praise you for uh, just what you have uh, done and what you continue to do, that you have set us apart uh, to serve you and to love you and to uh, honor you, that uh, we are called to gather together to worship you and that you have given us your word, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. I pray now as I uh, bring this Parsha of Scripture to my brothers and sisters and to guests here this morning, that you would honor your word as you have promised you will, and that you would strengthen our faith through it as you also promise in your word, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by your word. So bless us now as we look into it, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, Romans 15.4 tells us everything that was written in the past was written to teach us, to instruct us. This is one of the reasons why we as Jewish believers study the parshas, the portions of Scripture, every day. It was Ezra, actually, who set up the uh, daily or, in, or weekly readings of the parshas. And so in the, our parsha this morning, we have four different lives revealed. I'm only going to focus in on on uh, chapter 25, verses 19 through uh, 34. So if you have your Bibles, turn there, and that's where we're going to look at. And, and, and remember, this is just a portion of the Parsha, a portion of the portion. Uh, the title is called Taladot, which means generations, and it's named for the word expressing the emphasis of the entire Torah and Haftorah a portion, meaning that it has to do with the generations and the transition from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But let's begin in verses 19 through 21, which uh, Joel had just read, and I thought he did a great job. Uh, this is the account of these, or uh, th this is the account of these generations of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean, from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered, her, answered his prayer. And, um, and uh, his wife, Rebe Rebekah, became shvenga, as we would say in Yiddish, pregnant. Well, with these verses, we see the shift from Abraham's life to, to Isaac. Abraham um, was 100 years old when Isaac was born. And Isaac married Rebekah when he was 160 years old, when his, uh, 
when, uh, or rather, uh, Isaac, when Isaac married Rebecca, he was 140, and when he was 160, he had grandchildren. He became a grandfather, and those sons were Jacob and Esau. In uh, verse 21 of our Parsha this morning, we learn Rebecca was barren, unable to conceive, and uh, could not have children. And this was not a unique problem uh, to our fathers in the faith, for Sarah herself had problems conceiving. This is no coincidence. But rather, God ordained. Both women's barrenness was for the glory of God. One of God's reasons for this situation, the fact that both Sarah and Rebecca were barren, was to encourage Israel and you and I that we can look back and see that our existence as a nation and as a people who have been grafted into that nation was not a result of Planned Parenthood, but rather God's intervention. Now, this should encourage the children of God, you and me, and Israel. That was his plan. God's supernatural power is, is, is at work in causing us to become children of God. As John tells us in, in John chapter 1, verse 13, we are children of God, born not of natural descent, nor of a human decision or of a husband's will, but rather born of God. Each one of us who have come to faith have not been born because we made a decision on our own behalf, but in fact it was the work of God. For by grace have we been saved through faith, and that even that is not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. We became children of God through his supernatural intervention. So we, like Israel, as a result of knowing that, can depend on him to complete the work which he's begun in our lives. We were born miraculously, just as uh, Isaac was born miraculously, and just as Jacob and Esau were born miraculously. As Paul reminds us, he who began a good work in us will continue and perfect it in Messiah Yeshua. Well, in verse 21, we learn that with the, the reality that uh, Rebecca could not have children, Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife. God's covenant promise to Abraham and his descendants included a multitude of, uh, of offspring. So Isaac was promised by God that he would have children, and so he prayed. And so we see two things from Isaac's example. First, having a promise from God does not necessarily mean that the promise will come immediately or easily. It certainly didn't in Isaac's case, and it certainly didn't in Abraham and Sarah's case. He was 60 before he had the promised children, and, and Abraham was 100. No, it's through trials like this that God calls us to trust and have patience. Well, sadly, usually our prayer is, Lord, give me patience, but give it to me now. And we need to understand that patience only comes through trials. Isaac prayed according to the word of God. And this too is an example for, for us today. God has given us promises in his word, victory over sin, peace in troubling times provision for our daily needs. But we still need to pray on these promises, especially when we encounter obstacles and defeat and failure. Too often we miss the promises of God because we do not pray. Prayer is not a waste of time or, or merely a religious exercise. It's designed by God to help us align our hearts to his word and his will for our lives. That's why we pray, to develop the mind of God, the heart of God, to, to pray as the Lord taught his disciples, his Talmudim to pray, uh, Lord, th thy will be done, thy kingdom come on earth 
as it is in heaven. It's aligning ourselves with God's will and God's way and God's kingdom. God answers prayers, as we see in verse 21, which says, the Lord answered Isaac's prayer for his wife, and Rebekah became pregnant. So the second thing we learn from our Parsha this morning is that when God's people are in need, they should pray. Well, looking at verses 22 through 26, we read this. The babies jostled each within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb, and the first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Yaakov, Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Now that expression, the babies jostled within her, the Hebrew word for jostled is a strong word that is sometimes used to crush or bruised, which tells us something tumultuous was going on within Rebecca's womb. This wasn't just active babies kicking inside of their womb. She could tell that this indicated some kind of problem, something different, something more impactful. This shows us that even the answers to our prayers don't come with some difficulties and hindrances. Even when we pray, to receive the promises of God, we find that they're not without troubles, without surus. When some of us have prayed and God answered our prayers, there were problems that came as a result of those prayers. When we prayed for children, for example, we've seen that along with the answer came trouble. Life will not be perfect until we get to heaven, no matter what we pray for or the promises that we receive. We're told, in this world, we will have trouble. And so Rebecca is in turmoil and confused, and she wonders, why is this happening to me? Now, I bet you've asked that question before. But have you asked the right person? Usually, we complain to other people. Usually, people ask the question rhetorically, speaking to themselves, or, or as I said, other people, or, or, or a pastor, or a relative of a friend. Why not instead do what Rebecca did and go to the Lord? She was in turmoil and confused, so she inquired of the Lord. Now, we may not always receive a direct and clear response as Rebecca did, but we can expect and can know that God will give an answer. As our brother Jacob, also known in the Brit Hadashah, James, says in in chapter 1 of his letter, he says this in verse 2, Considered all joys, my brother, considered all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask him of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven tossed and driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he'll receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. So when we pray, God says he will answer. God tells us he will answer. It may not be the answer we want, but he does answer if you seek him and you pray and look into his word. His, may, his response may be, keep walking by faith without clarifying why we're going through the particular circumstances we're experiencing. So now we've learned two lessons in our Parsha this morning. The lesson from Isaac, when God's people are in need, they should pray. And the lesson from Rebekah, when God's people are in turmoil or confused, then we should also pray. And also look to the scriptures, look to God's word. In verse 23, 
the Lord tells Rebecca that the turmoil within her womb is a preview of a struggle between the twins and their offspring, their descendants. The Lord says, two nations are in your womb. From the latter part of Genesis, we know that these two nations are Israel, descended from Jacob, and the Edomites, descended from his brother Esau. These two nations would become, sadly, mortal enemies. For most of biblical history, they were at each other. The Edomites caused to exist, uh, or actually ceased to exist, as a separate people in the first century AD. But not before producing King Herod, who was an Idumean, which is a Greek word for Edomite. And, uh, and that land, by the way, uh, is uh, where they stayed, is in the land where Petra is. Uh, Joanne and I led a group from Moody with Pastor Lutzer, and at Petra, we met the former pastor of the Olive Tree Congregation, uh, um, uh, David, uh, Rothberg, Stuart Rothberg. Uh, we met him at Petra. It was just amazing. Uh, it was quite an experience. But that's the land of the Edomites. That's where uh, the land of Seir is. That's the land um, that... Uh, was constantly attacking Israel. And God had a predetermined plan for these two people groups. He proposed that even though Esau was the firstborn, Jacob and his descendants would receive the blessings and the benefits of the firstborn, though he was not the firstborn, Esau was. And this is what it's meant when the Lord says the older will serve the younger. Now, in doing this, God shows us that his blessings and callings are not based on merit or the traditions of man, which could have been the blessings to the, uh, which should have gone to Esau, the traditions of men. This is why the New Covenant scripture of Toledot includes Romans chapter 9. Those of you who, who get the Parshas should would see that Romans 9 is included in the Parsha reading. We who are uh, part of the remnant, Jewish people and Gentile people who have been made one, uh, we, have, we read these Parshas to help us uh, go through the scriptures. And it includes the New Covenant Parsha, uh, complements this Parsha in Romans 9. We read this in verses 10 through 12. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father Isaac. Yet before the twins, were born or had done anything good or bad in order that God's purpose in election might stand. Oy, face mirror, the word election. But God operates that way. God chooses, not by works, but by him who crawls. She was told the older will serve the younger. And so the lesson we learn from Jacob is that God's choices about the blessings we receive in our callings in life are not based on tradition and not based on merit. The text deals with God's right to choose people and people groups for certain earthly destinies, positions, responsibilities, without regard to the traditions of men or to the choices and will of men, whether or not they deserve to be chosen. How many of us have had a shlemiel for a boss and we wonder, what in the world? You know, why is that? And basically, essentially, God uses those shlemiels to humble us, to serve them. You know, you can't, Scripture tells us we're to be crucified with Messiah. And you can't crucify yourself. You can get maybe two-thirds of the job done. You can, you can put a nail in one hand and get a nail in your feet. But God raises other people to get that last nail in. So God is sovereign. He sovereignly places people where he chooses to place them. And so God's choice of another person, for example, um, for instance, God chose me to be a congregational planter and, and leader of a congregation and a missionary. But I can't boast about that because God's choice is not based on my merit. It was the Lord who caused those works to come and have life. God chose another person to lead a congregation ten times larger than mine. But I can't complain. 
that I should have that position because I work harder or I deserve it. In fact, probably I, I don't work as hard as that person who's got that big congregation. Why not? Because God's choices according to his, are according to his perfect will and not based on my merit. As John the Immerser, you know him perhaps as John the Baptizer, said in John chapter 3, he said, no man can receive anything unless it's given to him from heaven. None of us have a reason to boast or a right to complain. Many of our kinsmen miss the significance of God's choice of Jacob prior to his birth. Some of our kinsmen have become proud because we thought God's choosing of Jacob meant that we as Jews were more righteous, more deserving than other people. But the timing of the announcement in verse 23 makes clear that God's choices has nothing to do with the merit of Jacob or the merit of Abraham or the merit of Isaac. The birth took place just as God said, with Esau being born first, as with Jacob already figuratively trying to grab a hold of Esau and get the upper hand. And Esau, who's also called Edom, and received that name because of his wild and crazy red hair. Jacob means one who grasps the heel. In other words, one who tries to conquer by his own effort. Now this was a fitting name for Jacob because most of his life he tries to get things through his own means. It should be noted that when Isaac and Rebekah named Jacob, they were probably not thinking of him uh, as, as being, um, you know, a uh, person who always would be um, trying to gain his own way, but rather they were referring to him grabbing the heel. They, they were not as assuming or predicting that Jacob would be self-willed, which we see in Scripture. He was very self-willed. So in these verses, three lessons so far for us. First of all, from Isaac, when God's people are in need, they should pray. And from Rebekah, when God's people are in turmoil or confused, they should pray. And from Jacob, we learn that God's choices and blessings and callings in life are not based on what we deserve. Actually, what we deserve is judgment and damnation. That's really what we deserve. But by God's grace, he has provided a way of atonement. He's given to us a righteousness that we don't deserve and grace through the work of God, by our transferring our trust from ourselves to the person of Yeshua, who paid the penalty for our sins and is our righteousness. We have no righteousness in ourselves. He is our righteousness. And finally, in our Parsha this morning, we see how a person can lose spiritual blessings by foolish thinking and foolish actions. We see how and why Esau was foolish and what lessons we can learn from him. In verse 27, we learn that as an adult, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a peaceful man or a quiet man staying among the tents. The point of this verse is not to infer, infer that being a manly man an outdoor type leads to foolish choices. I mean, there is that temptation to think that. While being a homebody leads to receiving the blessings of the Lord, Jacob was no mama's boy. Later in Genesis, Jacob lifts the lid off of a well that would normally take several men to lift. Of course, he was motivated by Rebecca. I mean, uh, Rachel, Rachel, who was, you know, stunning. Anyway, the point of this verse seems to be how life interests are reflected in the son's characters. Esau was a hunter of wild game and animals and in some way was like an unreasoning animal himself. He acted on instinct and impulse without the regard to the consequences of the future. And Jacob was a quiet man or peaceful man. That word quiet or peaceful is from the Hebrew tam. Have you ever heard that expression, to be Tom? It's translated here and in other places as one who is complete or blameless. But you can understand why these words might not be fitting for Jacob. 
In this context, perhaps, the word means self-control, or, or could also mean reflective. Characteristics, when you look at Jacob's life, doesn't seem to exist, doesn't seem to be evident there. But mostly, Jacob was known for his selfish motives. But in verse 28, we learn that Isaac and Rebekah each had a favored child for different reasons. Isaac liked the food that Esau provided. But Rebekah loved Jacob, and, and it seems to be based on God's promises that he would receive the covenant blessings. Because God told her firsthand that the older would serve the younger. And she understood that, that that would be the blessings of the Lord. Well, whatever the motivations, favoritism in a family and some in, in families is sometimes disastrous, isn't it? Other accounts in Genesis emphasize this point, such as Jacob's favoritism over one of his wife over another, and, 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 and uh, Jacob's favoritism of his son Joseph over the other brothers. It was disastrous because of that. In verses 29 to 34, we learn that Jacob made a deal with Esau. Esau said his birthright, uh, or, or sold his birthright, to Esau for a for a bowl of red stew. Birthright in this, clay, in this case includes the, the future promises. The blessings of Isaac were going to go to Esau because he was the firstborn, but, but Jacob wanted that blessing. And Esau sold his birthright. The blessing of Abraham given to Isaac, and then to be given to the next son. Now, this was a foolish act on Esau's part, but it's instructive so that we don't make the same mistake. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, we're told specifically, do not be godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. What was Esau's downfall? Well, Esau lived for instant gratification. According to verse 32, Esau could only think about his current hunger. So distant blessings seemed of little value to him. He didn't think the promises of God were worth waiting for. I'm hungry. I need to eat now. In other words, Esau despised his birthright. So from Esau, we learn that spiritual blessings can be lost by living for the moment. We need to be careful not to let satisfying the desires we want today to rob us of the spiritual blessings that God has for us tomorrow. We, not, we need to not be focused on earthly pleasures, but rather eternal pleasures and treasures. If it feels good, our world tells us, do it. That was the saying in the 60s, which I was a part of. But believers need to base their choices with eternity in mind. Every one of us will be offered the opportunity to live for the moment or to live for eternity, to live for eternal consequences. It may be an, an, an occasion to cheat on your spouse or, or, or maybe uh, to receive a lot of money in a wrongful way or indulge in worldly desires or, or receive a promotion or a position in an illegitimate way or to become popular in ungodly ways. We need to watch out and remember, spiritual blessings can be lost by just living for the moment. And so Esau made the, the foolish decision to take the immediate payoff for what he could see, what he could touch, what he could taste and smell over the greater blessings in the future. And sadly, many still do that today. Their whole lives are focused on what they can get now, and they end up missing the blessings that are forever. Now, speaking of such people, Paul said their destiny is destruction because their God is their stomach, physical pleasures and their minds are on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. That's what commended Abraham to God. He was looking for that city whose builder is God. 
And so in verse 34, we see that Esau ate and drank and then got up and left. He went on with life as, as usual, oblivious to the consequences of the choice that he made. The consequences of living for the moment were not immediate, but they did come eventually. When they arrived, the consequences arrived to, to Esau's life, and he pleaded for the blessings of God, but he was not able to obtain them. We read again in Hebrews chapter 12, see that no one is, is immoral or godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. And afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought it with tears. And so we need to keep this in mind the next time we're tempted to forget about the consequences of that sinful act, living for the moment. And so from these four verses, from our Parsha this morning, we learn four lessons. First of all, from Isaac, when people, when God's people are in trouble, when they are um, in need, we should pray. From Abreka, we learn when God's people are in turmoil or confused, we should pray. And from Jacob, we should remember that God's choices about our blessings and callings and, and situations in life are not based on merit, not based on, on the traditions of man, but are sovereignly chosen by God. He is the one who has given us the path that we are on. And we need to align our will with his. And fourthly, from Esau, that spiritual blessings can be lost when we live for the moment. And so God's word teaches us how to live, how to pray, and how to walk. And if you will, would you join me in prayer? Ovino Malkeno, our Father and our King, we thank you and praise you for your word which instructs us in your ways and, and Lord, doesn't cover the warts and the blemishes of mankind, but Father teaches us and instructs us and helps us to see your will and your ways revealed through your word. And I pray, Father, that your spirit today has spoken to our hearts. If there are any here among us, Lord, who have not come to know you in your ways, I pray that today, if they've heard your voice, that you would touch their heart and they would come to you. If any are, have strayed from the path, Lord, among my brothers and sisters, I pray today that they would return to you and once again surrender their lives to you, your word, and your spirit. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.